Okay, and then I'm gonna go share screen. This one. And then we'll do slideshow. Play time start. And then you can go ahead with this. This. Oh, oh that's much easier. Mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. Yep. And then let me see if I can move this guy. So this should be finalized here before too long. But yep, there you go. Okay. And then I have to have this too. Okay. And then you can put yep. All right. All right. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here with uh, a group of organic farmers and supporters. And before I start talking about my experiences, let me learn a bit about you, because I know some of you, but not all of you. Yes. Even closer to me or up? Okay. Is that better? Okay. If you're an organic farmer, stand up. You need a little exercise after that meeting, right? <laughs> okay, if you are a row crop farmer and you're standing, wave your hand. If you're a row crop farmer, I guess even if you're seated, you can wave your hand. Laura, you are. Um, fruits and vegetables. Wave your hand, even your, you can go ahead and sit, I guess. We'll just wave hands. All right. Animals. A few. Um, and the rest of you who are organic farming supporters, wave your hands. <laughs> Hopefully I've got everybody. I want to know who has done on-farm research with organizations or universities. Wave your hands. She's not waving back there. I know that. All right. Uh, formal or informal, how many of us have done informal on our farm by ourselves and forgot to write it down and lost it? Yeah, okay. Um, and I want to know who in this room may have helped provide an ingredient for tonight's dinner. Anybody? They're not present? Okay. Something to think about for next year. Um, it's not advancing. Olga. Oh, there it is. It is there. It's not on my screen. Just hit return. Oh, instead of that, just hit. Wait. Oh. Okay. There we go. All right. That's my farm. It was my farm before I retired. Uh, I want to know where you first learned of organic farming and gardening. Were you born into it? Anybody here born into it? Okay, on a farm? Great. One person in this room. So the rest of us found it later in life, right? Me too. Um, I grew up on a small farm in, um, in Oklahoma. This is the farm I farmed in Iowa that you're looking at. But I grew up in Oklahoma. And we had big gardens for a family of seven and learned the importance of growing our own food and what that tasted like. That and being the cook in the family certainly inspired me to start my own organic fruit and vegetable farm. I first learned of organic agriculture from the organic gardening magazines found at the grocery store aisles at checkout in the 70s and 80s. I liked that the Rodale Institute, the publisher of Organic Gardening, did research to back up their talk. I also enjoyed the anecdotal accounts in the magazine from readers' experiences in their own gardens, otherwise known as networking. It resonated with my desire to question the narrative of gardening and farming using chemicals and synthetic fertilizers. I was a chemistry biochemistry major in undergraduate college. So when I read the chemicals listed on the labels of pesticides and synthetic fertilizers, I questioned why I would use this on the food I was growing and feeding to my children. I'm sorry, I am not indicating to you when to advance. So are you okay with that? <clears throat> All right, next slide, there we go. <clears throat> About the same time as my husband and I were raising our daughters, 
I was director of religious education at our church for a few years, which honored certain purposes and principles. And several of those principles affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. That too resonated with my same thoughts about organic farming. Next slide. A favorite story when once used in church school was titled, Who Speaks for Wolf? by Paula Underwood. Who Speaks for Wolf is a Native American learning story about a young man, Brother Wolf, who believed it was possible for his tribe to live alongside the wolf instead of becoming a people who killed the wolves for their own convenience. Brother Wolf believed that someone should speak for the wolves, but when his tribe needed to relocate to a new place and made a decision to move into an area that was a wolf habitat that would affect the wolf's land and life, Brother Wolf was not present. When he returned, he protested, but the tribe had already made their decision. Later, the wolves did indeed become a nuisance intersecting with the people. Dealing with the wolves began to take more energy than it would have taken to relocate elsewhere. The tribe had made a decision that had not considered all the ramifications of how their move would affect the ecosystem. Brother Wolf had been right. Next slide. Another favorite phrase in our church that we used was the answer is to question. Do you remember when you first questioned authority other than your parents? My first questioning of authority that I remember came in first grade with Mrs. Weaver. She was explaining good health practices which included brushing your teeth upon arising before breakfast as well as after meal. Well, this made no practical sense to me because I ate immediately upon arising. Why brush your teeth moments before eating when you would do it again after eating? When I raised my hand to share my better idea, I became aware, luckily without reprimand, but rather with silence and a frown, that the teacher did not like my comment. Are your bright ideas being squashed by the narratives out there? I'm sure all these experiences helped me to embrace organic farming. How fitting that I opened my Fedco seed catalog last week and found this quote by Sherry Mitchell, Penobscot leader, why are we creating a world no one wants to live in? I returned to uh, school after raising our daughters and doing the stint as director of religious education. I got my master's in horticulture at Iowa State University, where I met a number of the people here tonight, both on campus and off campus. On campus, I was nurtured by my advisor, Gail Nonicky, and received the benefit of the first horticultural grant awarded by the Leopold Center to her. It helped fund my research, alternative production systems for strawberries. When I started graduate school, I wondered what research I could do that would coincide with my values and this fit perfectly. Off campus, when time allowed, I attended a number of upper Midwest organic farming conferences. Anybody been to those? Yeah. These were the formative years in the early 90s of local food inspiration in the Midwest and Iowa. I was learning about CSAs, inspired by the idea of cooperation rather than competition, and all the other things I learned there. Upon graduation, I established Turtle Farm, my organic fruit and vegetable farm in central Iowa. I joined PFI where I first met more of you Gave me, and it gave me the opportunity to do on-farm research. The first experiment I did was enlightening in that it occurred on two different farms with different soil types and different weather experiences in two different seasons. Needless to say, the results varied a lot between repetitions. It's hard to contain all the variables in a research project when it occurs in real life on the farm. It illustrates how important the integrity of the research is, how well it is designed, and how best to interpret it. Next slide. An example of how poor research can lead to poor results and poor after effects is mentioned 
in this book, An Immense World, How Animal Senses Reveal the Hidden Results, Hidden Realms Around Us by Ed Young. I paraphrase from his book. John James Audubon, the avid naturalist and artist, was best known for painting North American birds and compiling those pieces into his books. But he was also responsible for seeding a century long falsehood about birds through some truly abysmal experiments involving vultures. Since Aristotle, scholars believe that vultures had a keen sense of smell. Audubon thought differently. When he left a putrefying pig carcass in the open, no vultures came to eat. These birds, he claimed in 1826, find their food with sight, not smell. Never mind that vultures prefer fresh carcasses and ignore overly stinky ones like the kind Audubon used. The idea that turkey vultures and by dubious extension all birds can't smell became textbook wisdom. Evidence to the contrary was ignored for decades and the study of bird sense of smell lapsed into neglect until the 1960s. No one dared to question the narrative for 130 years. You might think this could only happen in the 1800s, that people of authority would not be able to perpetuate such claims in today's science. So you can imagine that for me, when the news media during the pandemic, dealing with so many unknowns, so many variables, used the term, the science, to justify everything. I could not but have doubts. Whose science? Today's science, yesterday's, 50 years ago, whose interpretation, without bias, with transparency? Anyone doing research knows that science is a moving target and should always be open to further refinement and experimentation, not censure or closed-mindedness as has occurred. I would prefer to say, this is what we think we know now, what might you be finding to add to or change that? That's why we continue research. And I urge you all along in your research, whether it's formal or informal. There are many areas uh, for improving our world through research we can, that we can do and um, may not be getting done now. When we are seeking the sweeter taste in our sweet corn or fruits, we are being ruled by our sweet tooth. New varieties of fruits are often chosen for their durability of shipping, like the hard strawberries without flavor you may find in the grocery stores. But are the nutrients of these food crops even considered in a new variety? Next slide, this chart is from the book, Eating on the Wild Side, The Missing Link to Optimal Health by Joe Robinson. It shows the um, total phenols on the left side of the nutrients of the apples that are listed on the lower side. The first six there that have some value, better value, are um, wild species. And the modern varieties are to the right of those. And you can see how much the phenolic or nutrients have decreased in that time. That last variety, ginger gold, does not even register on the map. So, um, granted, the original wild species were bitter and very small. These were the originals found in places like Asia and other places. But could we have not at least considered retaining some of those nutrients when we've created new varieties? if that were at least part of the research goal, retain nutrients. And it can be con uh, confusing, next slide, when we're not clear about the variables in research. When red meat is used in general terms and recommendations to eat or not eat, which animal raising methods are they referencing? It makes a big difference. This chart from PFI research summarizes those differences nicely. This is the fatty acids in animals and the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. What is considered healthy is four or less to one ratio. The average Western diet, unfortunately, is 20 to one. Grain-fed beef does a better job at nine to one, but the pasture-raised beef that Carney and Schmidt did in this research came out at two to one ratio. 
I always try to eat pasture raised beef. Anyway, I could go on and on about the kinds of research I wish we were doing that aren't being done, but you might be wondering what all this has to do with functional medicine. So enter my cancer diagnosis in the fall of 2007, a routine mammogram indicated and a biopsy confirmed potential breast cancer. Lumpectomy surgery put me on the traditional conventional healthcare train. You can almost hear the whistle blowing. The next stop on this train was automatically set up for me was radiation treatment. And then when the third stop on this train was oncology, which recommended uh, chemotherapy, I decided to step off this healthcare train. I looked elsewhere for inspiration, for research, and for alternative therapies. This was probably my most significant life experience of questioning authority. And my most important leap from on-farm research to on-body research. Part of that uh, exploration led me to functional medicine and naturopathic medicine. Just as Who Speaks for Wolf encouraged his tribe to live alongside the wolf instead of killing them for convenience after making an uninformed decision, what I call the whack-a-mole model, I wished to explore my diagnosis and learn to live in a healing manner that didn't involve violence or the whack-a-mole methods of chemo, radiation, prescriptions, etc. This is when I sought out advice from naturopathic and functional medicine doctors. Interestingly, naturopathic doctors are not allowed to practice in Iowa. So I went out of state to visit one. The alternative practices of functional medicine, naturopathic medicine, and I would also include in integrative medicine, have all have similarities. And for the intents of uh, my discussion, I'm going to kind of lump them all together as alternative therapies. Go to the next slide if you want. I will quickly run through some definitions I came up with. I hate to put that much print in front of you, but I'll do it quickly. Functional medicine is defined as a systems biology-based approach that focuses on identifying and addressing the root cause of disease. By addressing root cause rather than symptoms, practitioners become oriented to identifying the complexity of disease. The functional medicine model is an individualized, patient-centered, science-based approach that empowers patients and practitioners to work together to address the underlying causes of disease and promote optimal wellness. The next slide is naturopathic medicine model. It's a distinct system of primary health care that emphasizes prevention and the self-healing process through the use of natural therapies. Naturopathic diagnosis focuses on identifying the underlying causes of disease. Sound familiar? While naturopathic therapies are supported by research drawn from peer-reviewed journals from many disciplines. The therapeutic modalities used in naturopathic medicine integrate conventional, scientific, and empirical methodology with the ancient laws of nature. And then integrative medicine, and maybe Dr. Nish could probably elaborate even more on this, uses evidence-based approach to treat the whole person, your body, mind, and soul. Your physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual needs are all involved. So, sorry, advanced, advanced slide. Um, uh, it integrates conventional approaches and complementary or alternative therapies to achieve optimal health and healing. I followed many of the recommendations of my naturopathic and functional medicine doctors, and it set me on a new quest to explore this area further. For example, after learning that an important nutrient called DIM, D I M, which stands for diendolimethane, was present in, next slide. My crops of broccoli and its brassica cousins. So they had new meaning for me because they had are helpful for breast health. So just I'm I apologize for the weeds and the broccoli, but that's real life. Um, yeah, I <laughs> say I found many useful uh uses for weeds over the years. So Reflections after my medical experience, I couldn't help but notice the similarities between organic farming and these alternative medical practices. They seem to operate on the same paradigms. You might term it prevention versus reaction. 
Some of the operating principles of organic farming, which you know well, are it's a form of regenerative agriculture, valuing and building healthy soils to create healthy crops and animals, using compost and other natural products or processes, using disease-resistant crops or animals for prevention and evaluating causes of disease or nutritional imbalances to cure problems. In my farming experience, I considered what's causing this problem in my crop. Is it the variety, the weather, the planting distance? Is the soil missing nutrients? These processes and methods may take more time, more work, and more planning than conventional alternatives. Organic research is not always funded easily as there is not always a profit to be made. Federal aid programs may not be as available, especially for fruits and vegetables. Insurance may not cover as much as crop losses. So if you look now at the functional medicine principles, they look a lot like it. Look at, they look at the whole patient for root causes of disease. It recommends a variety of alternative practices, supplements, nutritional and environmental changes to suit the needs of the patient. These may take more time, more work, more planning and conventional recommendations. And research is often not funded because of lack of profit potential. Insurance may not cover these medical expenses. As organic farmers, that should all sound very familiar. And to contrast the operating principles of conventional farming, um, synthetic fertilizer and pesticides are used that can harm the soil and soil life rather than regenerative practices. Quick fixes such as pesticides and synthetic fertilizers are used to solve symptoms. Insurance is tilted toward conventional production systems. Federal programs are tilted toward grow crops rather than vegetables. Ag companies do research with profit potential. Tax specialists in place often recommend conventional methods. So you liken that to the operating principles of conventional healthcare. The focus often is on treatment of symptoms rather than the underlying cause of disease or problems. Quick fixes are often used like drugs or pills. Pharmaceutical industry often does research with profit potential guiding their work. Insurance is more likely and will approve and pay for this care. Doctors are not educated much on alternative practices and they can be censured by peers, insurance and hospitals if they deviate from approved guidelines. So the next slide shows a chart I came across that a uh, cardiologist, Dr. Mimi Gonnieri, prepared that I thought summarized nicely the allopathic or conventional uh, methods to the holistic or the integrative functional methods. Uh, allopathic would be reactive, holistic, more proactive. Allopathic disease-driven, holistic prevention is the, the rule. The allopathic or conventional looks maybe at parts of a person, whereas a holistic is treating the whole person. Allopathic is treatment of symptoms, holistic treating underlying causes. The allopathic may use fear as a motivator. I had a friend who had an oncologist tell him if he doesn't do chemotherapy, he'd be looking at his grass from six feet under the following summer. So I just, that irritates me, I'm sorry. Uh, feeling good is the motivator for the holistic model. Uh, the uh, conventional is external power and control. Holistic tends more to internal power. The conventional it would be considered a spiritual, whereas the holistic is more spiritual. And I inserted the quantum healing, which I think is probably the healing of the future, which is more like energy healing. Uh, anyone who, uh, yeah, I'll pass on. Uh, the next conventional is the quantity of life versus holistic would be considering quality of life. Uh, conventional more likely to be uh, treated as a machine and the ecosystem is the approach for the holistic. Or it can be summarized nicely in the conventional is mopping up an overflowing sink and the holistic is turning off the faucet. So, so where do these uh, organic farming and functional medicine paradigms leave us? Next slide. I think you've probably all heard of this quote by Buckminster Fuller. Fuller you never change things by fighting the existing reality. 
to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Or, next slide, as our beloved uh, farmer Dick Thompson would say, get along, but don't go along. I encourage you to do your own research, follow your intuition and heart, whether you are doing on-farm research or on-body research. I do not advocate against doctors. We need them for many things, especially acute and emergency conditions. And we can learn helpful things from ag specialists. I just advocate toward a more judicious application of the healing arts as well as the farming arts. I urge constant use of your discernment on all fronts. Examine your own beliefs as well as others. We can remember that we are the boss of our body as well as our farms. We do not have to give away our power to doctors or ag specialists or for that matter in the wider circle to ministers, professors, parents, teachers, police, government, or cultural aspects of mass consciousness. I would just ask, I would just ask that you go out and help create a world that we all want to live in. Thank you. And with that, I leave you with just a couple of images from Turtle Farm. And I'm happy to answer any questions if I left enough time. That's naturopathic. Okay. Yeah, functional medicine doctors, they, they do exist in Iowa. I go to one, I know a couple of them, both of those. There aren't very many of them. You may have to hunt for them. I know that these two that I do know were traditional doctors who left that because they were dissatisfied and went back and got further training in integrative or functional medicine. And now they're doing that rather than the traditional doctor. So I don't know how many there are, but they do exist. And there are naturopaths in Iowa. They just aren't allowed to practice. They can do consulting and stuff. Yes. So we have a naturopath living in our neighborhood. Is just like we like you want to buy organic to support organic farmers you want <laughs> hopefully can find a doctor that you want to support as well okay. tell me her name again and will that be in the recording Sophia Hildress Okay. Thank you. Margaret? Enjoy. Are you continuing to use natural habit principles that you do now in the early century? Mm -hmm. I am. I, yeah, that's not something you give up any more than you would organic farming. <laughs> um, obviously, I mean, some of the things that were were obvious now were like you know just simple things like stop eating sugar uh come back on the caffeine or eliminate caffeine your vitamin d is really low you're a farmer why is your vitamin d so low well you know people tell you if you're out in the sun too much you might get skin cancer so you cover all up i would wear long sleeves all summer and a visor and my vitamin d was too low so vitamin d has been known to be uh, very helpful for breast health and as well as many other things. So some of that stuff you just start doing, you examine the products you're using in your home, that, you know, your, your soaps and all kinds of things, and, you know, everything to the EMFs, you know, you, you keep you keep learning. There's research continuing to come on and things you can do and try. So, but yes, I do go to functional medicine, John and I do to, uh, to do our uh, regular checkups. So what would you recommend well, the first thing is the awareness. 
I mean, maybe some of you didn't even know these type of doctors exist. The other thing is everybody has to decide for themselves whether that's for them or not. I mean, I'm not here to tell somebody, don't go do the conventional route. Um, I think it's nice when you can include everything. And if I'd had a different diagnosis, I might have gone the conventional route, but with mine, I didn't. So I think people just need to start looking for, for these options that are out there. I know you're you're recording this, so there's a <laughs> there's a way you're helping educate. Anybody else have ideas? How many in here knew about functional medicine doctors? Okay, well I'm preaching to the choir. No, okay, okay. Does that help? I, I I'm probably not solving your problem, but. Polka. Is it true that most functional medicine doctors don't work through your insurance? So you kind of have to pay out of pocket. Is that kind of the the, the ones I've worked the ones I've worked with? That's the way it is because yeah, they're often not accepted. Now yeah, but you can submit them like for their checkup uh, <clears throat> things we have. You know the blood work and all of that when we go to our infection. But you, I can go and submit that to my insurance and get reimbursement usually. But some of the other treatments, you know, maybe not. So. <laughs> okay, Margaret. No, I, I, this is kind of specific, and it's kind of personal, so shut me down. Okay. Um, did you revisit your own college after you were going to some alternative treatments? Did you revisit the alternative? Um, Can't rest with it. No. I mean, once you decide not to do that, you're done with the oncologist if you're not going to do the chemotherapy, at least in my case. I didn't go through with the radiation. I did before I got over the point where I didn't want to do this anymore. And so you now once you choose not to do the chemo, then there was no reason to see her. She was very concerned about about me, I, when I came in for a checkup, she, uh, it's interesting if you ever get your doctor's reports of what they write, if you request those and get them, it's interesting to see what they say about you. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> at least she didn't call me a wacko. But anyway, you know, I, um, she saw something on the x-ray, went for x-ray and she, she got all upset. She said she was really worried that I was, you know, blowing it by not, doing chemo and so she had me go do a imaging body imaging <clears throat> I think it was what I had worn that day to do the x-ray there was some they didn't have me take my shirt off that I was wearing and put on you know something from the hospital and it was kind of had some of these metallic designs through it and I think those must have showed up on the radar and, and scared her and but there was nothing on the the MRI or whatever it was that I took so but I could tell her concern about it and you know in the little report she wrote she said I had gone to an herbalist well I hadn't gone to an herbalist I'd gone to a nature path but you know it's people don't know that they don't know what to call it so but no I I didn't and uh, uh another thing that instead of <clears throat> instead of doing mammograms which for someone who is not well endowed um are painful anyway and they have to repeat them numerous times when they found the uh the uh, markings on the mammogram that indicated I might have a problem. We repeated that about five or six times. I mean, the x-ray technician was in tears and I was getting very frustrated. I didn't know I could say no. <clears throat> I should have just said, that's it. If, the, if you can't see it, then fine. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. But anyway, I have since chosen after that to do uh, thermograms. They're much easier with somebody who doesn't have much flesh to squeeze between those paddles. And I also know people who've done thermograms who have had a cancer that it didn't catch. So, you know, you have to be careful. So. Yes. Continuing with Margaret's asking personal questions. <laughs> I'm just curious, as you were with this patient, like, 
Is that a failed attempt to ask what church I went to? <laughs> because if you knew, you might not ask the question. I, um, <clears throat> one of those purposes and principles was the uh, search for truth and meaning of everyone's own journey. So it was more of a internal intuition, gut decision that just like you couldn't maybe go put chemicals on your crops I didn't want to put chemicals in my body if I could keep from it. So I guess I had faith that I had the inner constitution to go through with this for better or for worse. I mean, I I told myself, okay, you do this and you'll accept the consequences. And I was fine with that. So if you call that faith, then yes. But as a member of the Unitarian Church, <laughs> some people would not call it that. So. Yes. Well, it was important to me and to my husband that we try and keep the farm a farm because it is located in Granger, Iowa, right on an, on the State Highway 17. And I the housing development, which you can see right there in that picture at the top there, top right. Housing development came in right next door to us. We watched that get developed. It was very painful to see what they did to um, the soil when you build houses. Um, so we decided we'd like for it to remain a farm. And I knew if I just sold it to another farmer, they could in turn sell it and it could be developed. So what we chose to do was we sold the top third of the farm, which was the top of the hill, best view, worst soil. So we sold a third of the farm to be able to finance or being able to donate the rest of the farm to a nonprofit so it could stay a farm. And we chose Practical Farmers of Iowa to donate it to. So they own the farm and they now rent it to a beginning farmer who happened to work for me. So. That's what happened to the farm. It's gonna be a topic at the PFI conference on land transfer. Because we looked at a number of things. We looked at co-housing. Ben is still there. A wabi-sabi. Not wasabi, wabi-sabi. I don't know. Right, right, yeah. I mean, he worked for me about six years and then, yeah, then he ran his own. Did one more question? Or, oh, yeah, you tell me when to stop. Oh, no, you, you've got another five minutes. Okay. I'm curious what you think of the COVID 19, Scott. Uh, well, I don't want to make this into a political discussion, uh, but my doctor didn't get one. And my husband and I did not get one. So we had concerns about the research around it. It wasn't um, because of some political belief. It was because of the what we felt the quality of the of the research and the something produced so quickly by the pharmaceutical company. Yeah. Patty. Thank you very much. It's like regenerative agriculture only, it's our bodies instead of the soils. 
that we're trying to keep healthy. Yeah. I think that correlates. I mean, that became obvious to me after this experience. It's like, no wonder I like this method. It's <laughs> organic farming. Right. Yes, George. Oh, yeah. I mean, I freeze blueberries and eat them all winter. I mean, any of the, any of the fruit crops like that, the ones that have been ripened on the vine or on the tree rather than, you know, shipped across country, half ripe and exposed to greenhouse or what is it, carbon dioxide, they're exposed to water to, no, ethylene to ripen them. Those that are ripened on the vine and are colorful or full of nutrients and so, yeah, absolutely. That's why I'm strawberries, I love my strawberries. Everybody take home everything. <laughs> selling them just that way. Yeah, yeah. Just to not take them, take them, <laughs> selling them. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Thank you, Angela. Thank you so much. All right, you guys, I actually have...